welcome. It feels like a bit of a significant time for the Message Trust and Riverside Vineyard as we partner together to reach this neighborhood for Jesus. Uh, Message Trust as he started in 1992. I thought I could rap for Jesus and I formed a band called the Worldwide Message Tribe and uh, we went into schools and tough communities in Manchester and I would literally go into schools rapping a bit like a demonized muppet going, jumping in the house of God. And uh, under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, young people thought it was good. And we, we even started to fill theatres and arenas and even football stadiums, preaching the gospel. And that was all we did really for the first five years. About five years into the, the history of the Message Trust, we did two missions in a, two really tough communities in Manchester. And at the end of those missions, a hundred young people turned up for the local church we were partnering with. There's only 20 people in that church before that. And we're like, how does a church of 20 people cope with this many young people who have addictions and brokenness and all sorts of challenges? So that was when we came up with the idea to do what we called Eden teams and we moved our first 25 people into Bench Hill which was then the most deprived ward in Britain and I think when the evangelists you know the guys who like to preach the gospel and shout it loud uh, start to get serious about coming alongside the poor and the broken sacrificially it kind of touches the heart of God and it was an absolute inflection point for the history of the Message Trust. And believe it or not, now 900 people have made that, that sacrificial step to live in over 80 Eden teams all over the world. And of course, working in these deprived communities, we end up doing prisons work. We've got a prisons worker in Felton. And uh, we end up doing a reintegration, providing jobs. Some of you may have been to our amazing coffee shop in Covent Garden. If you haven't, go. And you'll see our, our workers there who have on their T-shirts, ask me my story because because uh, it's a it's a reintegration process it's a, a program to help people who've come to Christ in prison and they all have amazing Jesus only stories so go it's on Neil Street the coolest coffee shop in London but it's a hub of discipleship and we have businesses all over the, the country we also have these amazing community groceries 65,000 member families are now providing healthy food for five pounds a shop uh, in 26 community groceries but not just just food, they're experiencing the bread of life. And the final thing we do is what we call training and equipping. We bring in young people from all over the world, 10 nations, four continents at the moment, for our message school of evangelism for a year. If you're a young adult, it's an amazing thing to consider. And we also have something we call advance. Um, advance is training young, not young, training men and women in groups of 12. Started with 12 young people in my office eight and a half years ago. I just gathered these guys and said, let's pray for one another. Let's be serious about reaching our friends for Jesus. Let's be accountable about our lifestyles and, and let's go for it. Let's meet every month and do this. Amazingly enough, that one group has now become over 20,000 groups, over 200,000 people in 100 nations. All sounds a bit mad, doesn't it? But it's happened because the Lord's breathed on it. And so what a journey it's been. We have hundreds of staff here in the UK, loads more all over the world. And the thing I'm particularly excited to be here in Riverside Vineyard today is because I talk about this next level partnership. On November the 15th, there'll be a gig here. This place will be rammed with young people from the local schools. We're in four high schools. I'll tell you what the names are in a moment because I've forgotten. But we're going to be presenting the good news in lessons. It's a talk call no more knives and we challenge young people about the dangers of knife crime and we have men and women who've had tremendous challenges in their lives but also took up knives in a violent way but when they met Christ they laid them down and instead of taking up the knives they're taking up the cross and they go into schools with beautiful stories and then at the end of that we do a, a gig in a local church guess what November the 15th is happening here in this place Dozens and dozens, possibly even hundreds of young people have come to Christ. We've seen it all as our amazing bands. Fortunately for everybody, I stopped rapping about 30 years ago and my hair fell out. But we have these incredible, cool young men and women who go in with this great, better story and bring hope in the schools. It's happening here in Felton in the next few weeks. We need you to pray. So just watch this video that will tell you a little bit more about what's happening. When we at the Message Trust heard that knife crime was on the rise, when we heard that 1,000 teenagers had been admitted to hospital because they'd been wounded by a knife, we couldn't sit back and do nothing about it. After 30 years of working in schools, we got together with the Violence Reduction Unit and decided to come up with a plan. 
The way that the team work with local police forces to bring a police officer into school, a face that might be known to students or certainly then they might see them out in the future means that there's also a really long-term impact benefit for the school. We do know that since the No More Knives tour has been in Balshaws that we have had knives placed in the drop boxes in Leyland Town Centre. Behind me you've got the knife angel, 27 foot of over 100,000 knives that have been taken off the streets. And we got a message to the young people that they have the power to change the community they live in by simply saying no to knife crime. So to make our streets safer, to keep our young people safer, I absolutely endorse the work that is being done through the No More Knives campaign to make sure that those messages get out to schools. Music is an amazingly important part of the No More Knives tour. One of the bands, OTC, who are on this tour have written a song specifically for this tour called No More Knives. So instead of hearing negative messages and messages that promote violence, young people are connecting with a band that are saying a completely different message. They're saying, put the knives down. This is so important. We want to see our young people living and thriving in safe communities. Will you partner with us to see change in your local area? Yeah. So, isn't that cool that that's happening? Knives will be laid down, but also Jesus will be honoured and young people will hear the gospel relatively proclaimed right here in Riverside Vineyard in a couple of weeks' time. So please do pray for that. And if you can partner, support, uh, if you can volunteer in any way, I'm sure you'll hear more about that. The message trust, of course, as we grow here in the UK and all over the world, we desperately need your support. But we also want to give you stuff as well. And this is our advanced group taster guide. If you like the idea, of meeting with some friends and sharpening one another in terms of just reaching people for Jesus. Every advanced group member, 200,000 now, is, in, is introducing on average five people a year to Christ. Wow. Imagine if you were doing that. How exciting that would be for this neighborhood. So please take that. That's free resource at the back. And if you were able to support the message in any way on a regular basis as we, you know, no more knives can't run on fresh air, all this beautiful work we're doing around the world, then we like to think partnership. Partnership with local church is key, but also local Christians. And anybody who partners with the message gets this fantastic partner pack, which is full of really cool resources. This is my latest book called A Burning Heart. I mean, it's a bit much to say it's cool, isn't it? But it's probably not the best Christian book ever written it's perhaps the best one I've written but uh, but uh, I spent two years going through the book of uh, 1 Corinthians in the Bible Paul's amazing letter to a community not unlike London with many of the challenges but how do we do mission in a cosmopolitan uh, lots of dark places it's a it's a beautiful letter and I wrote that book my friend Tim Tucker who heads up our work in South Africa He's an amazing guy, and he went out on holiday a few, eight years ago, and uh, on the second day, his wife, who was 38, they had three kids, had a brain aneurysm, and she died. And it shocked our movement to the core. But he wrote this beautiful book called Finding Life After Death. Is there a way to find grace in the midst of grief? And it'll be relevant to every one of us at some point. It's probably relevant to somebody right now, but somebody you know, you'll get that book. You'll get this book that is called being the message the message leadership team now we have grown fast we're a multi-million pound charity it's crazy from just uh, one or two guys having a go 30 years ago have we done anything so we, we dug into it. we've got different lead members of the leadership team to write stuff about loving the poor and acting like an entrepreneur and and uh, um, pray what the prayer culture we have at the message and there's like a dozen different chapters called being the message and finally you'll get this amazing little Amazing little book, written by my friend Matthew Kinton Smith, who was literally the fittest man I've ever met. And uh, we cycled across South Africa together. He used to be at Oxford Blue. And he came back and he was on his 100 mile bike ride, as you do on a Saturday, and he had a cardiac arrest. And he nearly died, and he was in a coma for nine weeks. And he came out of it a completely different man with a different set of priorities. And he wrote this book called Second Chance. You'll also get a CD, you remember them? 
from one of our bands and uh, lots more information about the message because we want to think partnerships. So if you're able to partner a regular gift, any amount, see Anna and Richard from the message back at the stand there. Thank you so much. And please pray for the No More Knives tour. I, you know, I'm an evangelist, go around the place preaching uh, and uh, do lots of this. Oh, pff, I've been in Rio in the last month and Amsterdam and Rotterdam preaching. And I normally always speak out of the New Testament. And, uh, but today I felt drawn towards a, a, a book in the Old Testament that is a gospel story. And I'm going to speak out of the book of Ruth. Many of you will know the beautiful story of Ruth. 3,000 years ago it was written, but massively, massively relevant for today. By the way, you want to know what schools you're going in, don't you? Yes, you do. Sorry. <laughs> this will mean something to you, but nothing to me. We're going in Heathland School, Bishop Wards, Spring West, and Reach Academy. That wasn't much of a woo because 4,000 local young people are going to hear the gospel. Isn't that fantastic? Anyway. Follow that mind. <laughs> We're in the book of Ruth. It's a beautiful gospel story. It's a, a story that's pointing to Jesus. It's a story that I've given the title today, From Awful Situation to Amazing Hope. It, it's a story of people who wonder where God is when tragedy strikes. And you heard about a couple of my friends, tragedy struck big time. In Ruth, it's a period in Israel's history where everything was going pear-shaped. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1 starts with these words. In the days the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And if you read the book of Judges in the Bible, the days the judges rule, ruled, the book of Judges finishes with these horrendous words. Where there was no king in Israel and everybody did as he pleased. It was a time when the nation had turned away from God and they were literally experiencing his judgment. In terms of chaos and famine, there were refugees and there's a picture of a woman who's fled Jerusalem because it's so bad. And he goes, she goes to a place called Moab with her family. And out there, tragedy after tragedy after tragedy. First of all, her husband dies. Then a, a, a daughter-in-law marries a beautiful son. He dies. The other son dies. Basically, death and carnage in this family. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning to hear this? It's an incredibly difficult time. And there's a terrible famine in the land. There's no social security. These poor women had lost their husbands. And they were absolutely bereft. I am going to depress you in the first few minutes of this message, and it is going to get better, don't worry. But I was at a conference, I was speaking at a conference in Manchester actually a few weeks ago, and I'm sat next to this lovely lady called, called Gwen who was worshipping away, and then we had to just have a little conversation. And I said, oh, tell me about yourself, self, Gwen. She said, oh, yeah, it's been hard recently. My husband's died, and I've been grieving that. And then uh, I'm bringing up a, a severely disabled daughter, and we don't know whether to put her into full-time care or not. And I'm carrying a lot at the moment. And I thought, eh, Gwen, I am so sorry. I had no idea. You look like a beautiful, shiny Christian who's got the best life. And you're carrying all this stuff. The speaker that day was a woman called Ness Wilson. You may know Ness. She's an incredible speaker at this conference. I was speaking, she was speaking. And I was praying for her 13-year-old daughter that had cancer. And yet a 13-year-old daughter died. And Ness and her husband, Rich, who leads a ministry, are journeying through that. Then I'm like, I feel like a bit left up, right up, and then one in the chin when a pastor got up at the end and told his testimony about his wife. You may have even seen this in the press. His wife was murdered by his own son. And he was dealing with all that. And it was like one after another, the worst possible things you could imagine. And then I've got to get up and speak. And yet, that is life for some people. Maybe some people even in this church. Maybe it feels like one thing after another. And guess what? There's a promise of the Bible of this stuff. The Bible says, we're not going to print it on a t-shirt, but it's there in the good book. In this life, you will have trouble. In fact, Peter went on to say in his letter, why are you surprised by the painful trial you have, you're experiencing as if something strange were happening? 
You know, we get really surprised as shiny Christians when painful trials come our way as if something strange were happening. No, in this life, we are going to experience some terrible trials. And I'm only telling you that so you're not surprised. But, but that's not the end of the story. We don't face trials the way other people do. My friend wrote another book. He wrote a book called Finding Life After Death. He wrote another book called Grief and Grace. Because we don't grieve the way other people do. We experience the grace of God. Christianity is not a way out of life's problems. It's a power to go through. And there is a power, a power to face life's challenges so they won't take you out by the power of the Spirit. Naomi was a broken woman. She said, you can just call me Mara. Don't call me Naomi because my life's bitter. But God hadn't finished. Get ready. God was about to have the final word. God was about to turn it round to their absolute lowest ebb. So there they are, these three women. And Naomi says to her two daughter-in-laws, Orpha and Ruth, it's time for me to just go back home. Can't be worse than this, basically. I'll go back home to, guess where? Bethlehem. Hmm. You stay here. You find yourself another husband. And Orpha says, okay, fine. But Ruth was a young woman who had a different spirit. Listen to what Ruth said to Naomi, her mother-in-law. When her mother-in-law said, I'm going back to Israel, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn my back from you. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I'll die. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. Wow, what a young woman. Talk about love and compassion. Talk about a different spirit, the kind of spirit that gets the attention of the living God. And so they both go together. So Naomi gives way and said, Ruth, you can come with me back to Bethlehem. And as they arrive in Bethlehem, there's these beautiful little hints that Aslan is on the move. God's doing something. The tide is turning. As they get back to Bethlehem, the Bible says the barley harvest was beginning. At a time of famine, suddenly a harvest is coming. And not only that, Ruth says to her mother-in-law, I'll go gleaning at the harvest time. And there was a rule in Israel that the poor people could glean the edges of the field. And, it, and uh, wealthy business people were encouraged to leave an amount at the edge of the fields. I'm sure some of them didn't do it, but the good guys did. And they left the gleanings at the edge of the field so the poor could collect them. Ruth went to glean at the edge of this field. And there's this beautiful verse in the Bible that just stood out to me, even as I'm, I'm preparing this. As it happened... As it happened, the field that Ruth was gleaning in at her lowest ebb was Boaz's field. And Boaz was a relative of the family, a relative of Naomi. I wonder, Christian, how many times in your life, when you meet Jesus face to face, you're going to look back and you're going to be saying, as it happened... That person came along my way. As it happened, God bought that provision. As it happened, God turned my grief into grace. As it happened, God helped me to find life after death. As it happened, God stepped in in other ways. The favor of God in the darkest situation. Do you love our God? He's amazing. He's for us. And yes, in this fallen, broken world, we are going to go through stuff. But there's a power to go through. And as it happened... The field that Ruth was gleaning in was owned by a man called Boaz, a wealthy businessman who was related to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Ruth gets back and tells Naomi, she's like, I can't believe it. I know the guy. In fact, he's one of our kinsman redeemers. Because again, 3,000 years ago, there was this rule that if someone in your family was destitute and the husband died, you could take them into your family, bring her in as your wife and care for that woman. And Naomi's like, Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Get back to that field straight away. Glean, put your best gear on. Start gleaning. And Boaz, of course, notices this young woman and he's attracted to her. 
And he says to his servants, care for this girl. Give her extra grain. Give her, give her whatever she wants to drink. And then he discovers, oh no, she, she's one of my kinsmen. She's part of my family. And there's all this, read it in the Bible. It's only 85 verses. When you get home, read it. Take about 20 minutes, a half an hour, and you'd be blown away by this God story that's so relevant to everybody here. Boaz actually falls for this young woman and he decides to take her in as his wife. He decides to take her into his family and hope comes into this family. Of course, not only Ruth is cared for, Naomi's cared for. Guess what? Ruth then has a baby, the great grandson of David, the king of Israel. The great, great, great 26 times grandson of somebody you might have heard of, Jesus Christ. So through this incredible move of God, an awful situation brings amazing hope. Imagine being Ruth, turning up in heaven, and you discover all this. Imagine seeing all the people flocking into heaven through your great-great-grandson, but then your great-great-grandson, 26 times removed, is the saviour of the world. Is God come to earth. God can turn any situation, no matter how awful. Now, we specialize at the Message Trust in reaching the hardest people in the hardest places. And two weeks ago, a fella stood up in my church. It's a picture of him here. Cyril, you got that picture? <laughs> Cyril, and he's just married a beautiful woman. And we were at his wedding a couple of weeks ago. But Cyril said this in front of my church. He said, I remember my life at my lowest ebb. I was in prison and I was on 24-hour watch because I was suicidal and I was self-harming and all I wanted to do was die. I was addicted. I was experiencing the most appalling mental health crisis. And then a Christian came into my cell and told me about the love of Jesus. And it was that turning point. As it happens, the right person was just in that prison on that day and went into that cell, the most broken, hurting person. And anyway, then he said this, right? And I'm going out with Andy and Michelle, my wife Michelle's here. I'm going out with Andy and Michelle in a few weeks' time to mission in Uganda because we're launching the message in Uganda with a great festival over there. And he said, and I'm going to be doing prisons work with Andy in Uganda. And from a place of absolutely, the most awful situation this amazing hope's come don't you love this gospel and then I'll just tell you about one more I mean I, I, it's, I, it's not too much to say I could tell you thousands of these stories but one of my favourite at the moment is this girl Kelly so Kelly is from Middlesbrough our South Bank Eden team we're just about to we've just got funding for a grocery in South Bank that I'm so excited about very deprived neighbourhood but Kelly came to our prayer day. We have monthly prayer days uh, few, about 18 months ago. And she stood up and she said, I'm the first member of my family to become a Christian. She said, my family's infamous across Middlesbrough. We, we run so much of the, you know, my family are all in our prison. We run the drugs, we run the prostitution, lots of the gang stuff that goes on in Middlesbrough. And I'm the first person in my family, but I'm believing for a move of God in my family. And then she said this, my nana, you know, her grandma, had 11 kids, 56 grandkids, and 104 great-grandkids. And I'm believing for a move of God in my family, Kelly says. Anyway, so two weeks later, she comes back. She said, my brother Peter's got saved. Then she comes back and said, my mother's got saved. My brother's got saved. All her cousins are getting saved. And then this beautiful thing happened. She had a severely disabled son, 21 years of age. He can't really talk, but he just started to worship and lift his hands. And I've got the videos. It's, it's emotional to see this young man. Anyway, in two weeks' time, he's getting baptized. And the whole family's going to come. I mean, it'll be packed out with some of the craziest people in Middlesbrough. <laughs> because one person never truly gets saved, do they? When amazing hope comes into awful situations, you can't stop them telling others about it because hope is so powerful. Hope can turn any situation around. And I can sniff it in this church today. People who need the hope of Jesus because aren't you glad that Ruth's grand, great, 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 26 times grandson left heaven and came to earth, took on flesh as a man, 
and then to this great rescue mission to bring us out of our awful situation. Yes, Cyril was in an awful situation. Kelly was in an awful situation. I was in an awful situation. And you were without Christ. I was lost and hopeless. No amount of good works, rapping for Jesus, setting up charities, telling young people to lay down the weapons, that's not going to get me to heaven. Only Jesus' rescue mission. Only the fact that Jesus left heaven and came to earth. The, the, the Bible says that Boaz showed favour towards Ruth. Actually, the word is loving grace. And that is what I experienced the day I gave my life to Christ when I was 17 years old. The loving grace, as if I deserve to go to heaven. Guess what? I'm going. And you can come with me too. Nobody's stopping you, only you. If you'll give your life to Christ, if you'll turn away from your sins, if you'll ask his forgiveness, make him Lord of your life, you'll start to experience this amazing hope that only Jesus can bring. Now, when I get to heaven, it will be me, but I'll have a six pack and I'll have hair. <laughs> It'll be me the way I'm meant to be. But I'm going. Do you know you go to heaven when you die? Do you know you? I know I'm going because I've got on the only rescue boat that could take me there, the cross of Jesus Christ. And he's alive and I've experienced his Holy Spirit in my life. The difference that makes a power to go through the worst that life can throw at us. Jesus was fully man and fully God. He was our kinsman redeemer. He lived this incredible life, spoke these spectacular words, died on a cross, rose again, and he's here today and you can meet him. Let's just pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this beautiful story. Thank you that you can step into any awful situation and bring amazing hope. And I just want to give you the opportunity today. If you don't know you're going to heaven when you die, i.e. you've never really given your life to Christ, or you've fallen so far away, that perhaps you don't even know if you're a Christian anymore. I want to give you the chance to come to Jesus. And the beautiful thing is, in his loving grace, Jesus will come to you. Jesus said, anyone who comes to me, there's no way I'll turn them away. You know, there's 85 verses in Ruth. 23 times we heard the word redeemer. Redeemer. God can redeem any situation. Thank you, Jesus. So all I'm going to ask you to do, if you need to give your life to Christ this morning, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Not to me. That's it. That's it. Hands popping up around this church. If you need to give your life to Christ, don't miss this opportunity. Just keep your hand high because I want to pray God's best blessing for you. I don't have any magic powers, but I don't want to miss this opportunity coming from Manchester. That's it. Just raise your hand to Jesus. Say, Lord, forgive my sins. That's it. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Yeah. The Bible says there's rejoicing in heaven over one person who repents. So we've got a bunch this morning. So perhaps we could join with the angels rejoicing a bit. Thank you, Lord. I know, my time, I know my time's up, but I just want to pray this prayer. And if you raise your hand, and even if you didn't raise your hand, but you're not a Christian, you know you need to give your life to Christ. Just make this in your head and in your heart to Jesus. And he says, he says yes every time if you really mean it. He's so full of loving grace. So pray this after me and the whole church join in. But especially if you raise your hand, just make it in your heart and in your head. Dear Lord Jesus, loud after me, come into my life. Forgive every sin. Give me a fresh start. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you that you're alive today. Be alive in me, Jesus. And with your help, I'll live all out for you. Let your amazing hope come into my situation. Amen. Amen.